everyone. Happy Friday and thank you for joining us for this webinar today. I'm Christy Bagalow, the Director of Statewide Training at Florida Legal Services. We are so fortunate to have with us two attorneys from the National Consumer Law Center. I'll introduce them both in a moment, but first I just wanted to give you a few reminders. This webinar is being recorded and if any of your coworkers miss it, they can sign up to watch it on demand. I promise I did apply for CLE credit a month ago, but it's still pending. So I will follow up with everyone and get that CLE number to you as soon as I have it in my hands. Uh, tomorrow you'll get a link from Zoom with the recording of this webinar and a link to the materials, including the PowerPoint. When I get the CLE certificate, I'll also put it in that shared folder. So we're going to try to hold questions until the end, but I will be monitoring the Q&A box and the chat box if you have any questions that you want to type in and, and I'll get to them as soon as we can. So I'm very excited to welcome Andrea Bob Stark. She is a staff attorney at the National Consumer Law Center. She focuses on fair debt collection practices, including criminal justice debt. We also have with us Sarah Bowling Mancini, a staff attorney at the National Consumer Law Center who focuses on foreclosures, mortgage lending, and credit reporting issues. So welcome both and thank you so much for bringing this training to Florida attorneys today. Hi there, thank you very much. Sarah and I are very excited to talk to you today about mortgage relief that's available for homeowners during this time who are having uh, difficulty paying their mortgage. Um, we first want to start with a quick poll just to get an idea of the experience level of the audience. So if you could answer this quick poll of how much experience you've, you've had with mortgage issues and mortgage servicing issues, that would be very helpful for us. So we'll just wait a few seconds for people to do that. All right, people are really on top of this poll today. Um, it looks like we have quite a few who are new to this area. So I'm going to go ahead and end the polling and show everyone the results. We've got about 44% who are new to this area, 14% with zero to two years, and evenly split between two to five years and more than five years. Okay, so I will try and be as clear as possible. If there are any clarifying questions you need, please ask them and we'll try and get to them in the moment. If there are longer questions you have, more complicated questions, we're gonna try and save some, some time at the end for those. I do just want to emphasize how important it is right now for us to do this work and to realize what relief is available for our clients. I mean, I know that you've seen the numbers and heard the, the figures, 3.2 million, Americans are confirmed to have COVID-19. More than 150,000 Americans have died from the disease. And in April, as of April, over 20 million jobs have been lost. So huge economic struggles for people right now. And especially for Black and Latinx communities. And I just want to highlight this because it's such an important time to be focused on this issue that that the Latinx and Black communities are infected and hospitalized at higher rates. Through the end of May, uh, infections per capita were three times as high for African Americans and Latinx as for whites. 57% of Black respondents and 61% of Latinx respondents lost their employment versus only about 43% for white populations. And the impact from this pandemic is being compounded by the previous uh, financial downturn and economic downturn around 2008, people haven't quite come out or recovered from that and now they're being hit again by this downturn. And as of the first quarter of 2020, Black, Latinx, and white ownership rates were respectively 44, 48, and 73 percent. So that's a huge discrepancy there in home ownership. And we know that it's much harder to buy a home and, and obtain home ownership if you've lost a home. So even more important to provide relief for your clients to know what options are out there and try and get them into the appropriate relief. So just an overview of what we'll be looking at today. We're going to look at 
forbearance rights under the CARES Act. We're going to look at the moratorium under the CARES Act, which is now expired. So what do we do next? Uh, we're going to look, Sarah's going to talk about post forbearance options and some RESPA issues or Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act issues as well. Just know that this is a quick, quickly shifting landscape. Every day there are changes. There are changes federally and there are changes within your state. So be on top of those and realize what is changing and what's happening in this landscape. Uh, so let's talk about forbearance and moratorium rights under the CARES Act. So the, the, we do encourage borrowers, if they can pay their mortgage, to pay their mortgage, but we know that that's really not possible for so many people. They have to choose between food and their car and gas to get to work and their mortgage. And if they can't do all of that, then maybe they can get some relief for their mortgage. Um, just to know that for all loans, whether they're covered by CARES or not, the borrower has to be 120 days behind on the mortgage for foreclosure to start. So they do have a little cushion of delinquency before the foreclosure proceedings can start against them. Relief is available for most loans under the CARES Act, which was passed in March, March 27th. Um, we have a link here for you uh, that takes you to the CARES Act. It's a summary that NCLC has provided. And under Section 4022, there is temporary forbearance or relief available for federally backed mortgage loans. So what is a federally backed loan? Well, it is a loan that is secured by a first or subordinate lien, usually a one to four I'm sorry, it's a one to four family property and it's owned or backed by a federal agency like FHA, USDA, VA, Fannie, or Freddie. Uh, and how are you going to figure out what kind of loan your client has? Well, you can go to the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac websites and look up your loan or your client's loan with the address name and last four of the social. Um, but you can't assume just because it was a Fannie or Freddie a few years ago, it's still a Fannie or Freddie. It may have been sold, so you definitely want to check that. For other loans, the, if, to see if it's an FHA loan, you're going to want to look at the mortgage statement or the closing docs to see if it says on there this is an FHA loan. Again, HUD has sold some of these loans uh, in the Distressed Asset Stabilization Program. And so you want to double check to make sure it's still a HUD loan. You can look at the monthly mortgage statement and see if there is MIP or monthly, I'm sorry, mortgage insur and mortgage insurance premium they're paying. That's an indication that this is an um, FHA loan. Or you can call the HUD National Servicing Center to ask as well. Now, I provided some links here that um, give contact information for these agencies. I don't know how easy it will be to get through to them. These are uh, links from the Consumer Finance and Protection Bureau's website, which I have put down here. Um, but you can certainly call these agencies to see if it's a VA loan, USDA loan, and hopefully they can help you. Also, the mortgage servicer. The servicer is who your client pays their monthly mortgage payment to. The servicer should know who owns that loan. And if you still can't get an answer, you can do what's called a request for information. And this is under the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act. And a request for information, you can, we've given you language you can use to ask for the contact information and identification of the owner of the loan. And we've also um, provided you with some samples here that you can use. Just some quick tips about requests for information. You have to use the correct address for requests for information, or sometimes it's called QWR, or Qualified Written Request. And that address is usually on the mortgage statement or on the servicer's website, but it has to be that particular address or it won't count as a request for information. And you should get a response within 10 business days regarding the identity of the owner of the loan. And there are instructions here that the CFPB has provided, and we've provided some 
instructions on our samples as well. What's available if for federally backed loans? So you find out, okay, my client has a Fannie or Freddie loan. What, what, does, what is she entitled to? So if she's experiencing a financial hardship due directly or indirectly to COVID-19, she can request a forbearance agreement. And this is regardless of delinquency status. So we would push for this even if the person is, um, a foreclosure has been filed against the, the homeowner or if a judgment has entered because the language in the CARES Act is regardless of delinquency status. How do you get a forbearance uh, agreement under the CARES Act? Well, all the, the borrower has to do is request it. So they just have to request it on the phone, in an email, however they can connect with the servicer to request the forbearance agreement and affirm that they have a COVID related financial hardship. And that's it. There's no supporting documentation needed. What is a forbearance agreement? Well, a forbearance agreement is a reduction or suspension of payments for a set amount of time. It's temporary, so that's very important to remember. This is a temporary pause in a borrower's payments. They're not waived, they're not forgiven, they will have to be paid back. Uh, and we'll talk about those options later. If the uh, forbearance agreement does not cover, but I'm sorry, the forbearance agreement does not cover taxes and insurance, if there's no escrow account. So be sure to stay on top of that. If your client is paying their mortgage, principal and interest only, does not have an escrow account, they're gonna to have to figure out how to get the taxes and insurance paid on their own. What is the covered period for forbearance agreements? Well, the term covered period is not identified or defined in section 4022. It is defined in the next section, 4023, and in that section, it's the period beginning as of the date CARES was passed, March 27th, and ending the sooner of the termination date of the emergency as declared by the president or December 31st, 2020. And we have heard that even if the president declared the emergency over tomorrow, some of these federally backed loans are going to still allow forbearance agreements. Um, so there's no rush to get in there tomorrow if they really don't need it right away. Um, but the sooner that they get in, the safer they'll be. They'll be in the forbearance plan and they'll have some breathing room to figure out what to do next. So the forbearance is upon request of the borrower that they want a forbearance and they're entitled to uh, an initial 180 days and it can be extended for an additional period of 180 days. So they get up to one year of relief. They have to request it. They have to request the first uh, forbearance and some servicers are only putting borrowers in a three month forbearance. So be very alert on that and, and, and advise your clients at the end of the three months or very close to the end of the three months, if they need more time, they're entitled to more time if it's a federally backed loan, and they should certainly connect with the servicer to get more time. And they can get up to a year of relief if they continue to have COVID-related financial hardships. Now, what does the servicer have to do during this? What are their obligations? They cannot ask for additional documentation for forbearance. It is just the borrower's only affirmation that they are suffering from a COVID-related financial hardship and they can't charge fees, penalties, or interest in relation to giving a forbearance agreement. Again, it's up to 180 days with an additional period of 180 days, so servicers have to abide by that, and it is at the request of the borrower during the covered period. That's what the CARES Act covers. And at the borrower's request, it also may be um, shortened. So the borrower can say, you know what, I got my job back, uh, I, I'm all set, I don't need the forbearance anymore. Um, and also, we're hearing also that, say a borrower is in three months of forbearance and they decide I don't need anymore and they go out, but then maybe three months later, they're living in a state that is shutting down again 
and their, their job has been cut back or they lost their job again, they can ask to go back into forbearance. Um, so they get a total of 12 months. It does not have to be consecutive if they are suffering a COVID-19 related financial hardship. Andrea, there was one question that came in that I thought maybe we would take real quick, if you don't mind, yeah. it's about coverage of the CARES Act. So there was a question, does a second mortgage or home equity line of credit qualify under the CARES Act? Yes, so it is a subordinate lien, so second mortgages do are covered under the CARES Act, yes. So those would be covered. Yep, great. Uh, there is also protection uh, for multifamily properties. So you may have clients with uh, properties of fi a five, fam five plus family property. And um, it, it, the loan must have been current as of February 1, 2020. And those um, property owners can get up to 30 days, an initial 30 days, plus two additional 30 day periods. So a total of 90 days of forbearance total for those properties. And the landlord or the owner cannot evict the tenants uh, while they are in that forbearance agreement. So the moratorium um, under the CARES Act expired May 17th. So what, what can people do now? Um, that moratorium was, was very helpful because uh, the, the servicers couldn't initiate any judicial or non-judicial foreclosure. Um, or move for foreclosure judgment or order or execute a foreclosure related eviction, um, but that has passed. Uh, however, FHA, USDA, VA, all of the federally backed loans have extended that foreclosure moratorium to foreclosure sales and foreclosure related activity through August 31st, 2020. Nothing has been extended beyond that at this point, but it's my understanding that they are discussing it and I'm not sure where that will come out. So keep an eye on that as well. And we've provided a link of uh, the National Fair Housing that you can uh, check for that as well. And just keep in mind in Florida, um, I'm not, uh, I don't, I'm not licensed to practice in Florida and I'm not giving legal advice on practicing in Florida, but just be aware, I read an article that the governor extended the foreclosure and eviction moratorium to September 1st, but read the language carefully. It's my understanding that it suspends just the final action at the conclusion of an eviction proceeding and solely for tenants who have been adversely affected by the COVID-19 emergency. And what I was reading is this really isn't going to prevent any evictions from being filed at this point. So read the fine print on the moratorium um, regarding evictions and foreclosures to see if this really is beneficial to your client. Uh, and just know that a third of all adults in Florida miss June's rent or mortgage payment or won't be able to pay July's. And so just another reason why it's so important to know what remedies and relief is available. We are concerned with access to forbearance agreement. This may be a small population of borrowers, but there are borrowers that are delinquent, that are behind on their mortgage and not getting into a forbearance agreement. And so we would encourage all of you to reach out to your clients, your borrowers who are behind and let them know that forbearance is available. Even for non-federally backed mortgages, usually they can get into some kind of forbearance agreement. We're hearing that they either don't know about the options or they think they have to pay a lump sum at the end and Sarah will go over that, that that's not true in most cases, that, that some type of payment arrangement can be worked out and the, the payments missed do not have to be paid in a lump sum at the end of the forbearance agreement usually. Or they think they're just not eligible, they're delinquent so they wouldn't qualify. But please get them in contact with their mortgage servicer so they can find out what relief is available. If the loan is not federally backed, uh, it depends on who the owner or investor of the loan is, and the borrower is going to have to call the servicer to find out what options are available, review the websites. A lot of servicers are posting on their website what, what options are available and allowing borrowers to apply online for these options. Also, you could do another request for information asking for 
for who the owner is and what loss mitigation options might be available for the borrower. So again, use the correct address. They have 30 business days to respond to this type of request. And we've provided some samples for you as well on what to say in your request for information. And you can help your, uh, your client write that. We would suggest the client send it on their own, certified mail, keep the receipt um, and, and check when that's received so that you can start the, the clock on when the response is coming or should be coming. So I'm gonna pass it over now um, to post for variance options with Sarah, unless there are some questions that you want me to answer. Um, well, Andrea, why don't we just pause for a minute and see if any more questions want, if anyone wants to ask anything else related to the forbearance issues specifically. I mean, I thought you went through everything really clearly, but I know this is new for some folks. Um, so maybe just to reiterate the, the high points that even folks who are very far behind, if they have a federally backed mortgage, they should be eligible for the forbearance if they ask for it regardless of delinquency status, right? I think that's in a yes. way the most important point. Yes, yes. So people who are not in forbearance now and are delinquent should contact their servicer, definitely. And then there's one question here I think we can clarify is the distinction between the moratorium, the federal CARES mm -hmm. Act foreclosure moratorium versus the Florida moratorium. Um, so I think you were pointing out, Andrea, that the uh, Federal CARES Act moratorium ended in May. Um, yes. yes, the CARES Act, yes. But the Florida foreclosure moratorium, it sounds like has been extended just recently at the last second, but with some caveats of to read closely. Yes, and then each, and then the, the federally backed mortgages themselves have extended the moratorium. Um, a, a, a abbreviated version of the moratorium um, through August 31st. Right, that's a very important point just to reiterate too, that if, even though the statute has not been extended further with the moratorium on sales, right, those federal agencies have said we're extending it through August 31st. And at this point, we don't know if the federal agencies will extend that any longer. No. Uh, so we'll see what happens mm -hmm. with that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there was one more question that came in on the chat. If somebody defaulted months before COVID and they're already in foreclosure, should they still ask for forbearance? If so, could that stop the months of missed mortgage payments during COVID from accruing? Absolutely. So if they are three months behind before COVID, if they have, if, so to get the CARES Act forbearance, there has to be a COVID related financial hardship. So if there is a COVID-related financial hardship that's preventing them from getting back on track, then yes, they should ask for and request a forbearance. And if it's a federally backed mortgage loan, they should be able to get a forbearance. Great point. Okay, well maybe we'll, unless there's anything else right now, we can keep on going and we'll still save some time for more questions at the end. Um, so as Andrea mentioned, I'm going to go ahead and pick up here and talk about what options should people have at the end of the forbearance. You know, the forbearance is so important for this moment right now where people are dealing with COVID-related job losses or reduction in income, and it's really a temporary hardship. So the forbearance gives them a temporary a uh, bit of relief. It pauses their payments for a period of time. But keep in mind that unless they get permanent relief at the end of the forbearance, that those missed payments in theory would become due at the end of the forbearance. And as Andrea alluded to, we don't want people to be afraid of getting a forbearance simply because they're worried about that lump sum. The federal agencies and, and the government sponsored enterprises, which is Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, um, and so really all of these government related loans, which is at least two thirds of the mortgage market, they have provided a wide array of options to in a very streamlined fashion, get the mortgage brought current at the end of the forbearance. So the bottom line is that most people and virtually everyone who has a federally backed mortgage should have a good option at the end of the forbearance to bring the loan current without having to come up with a lump sum. So this is what we're gonna talk about now is what are those options and how to figure out which option the person will be eligible for in their specific circumstances. 
So let me just make sure I can get, there we go. Um, so keep in mind that the CARES Act itself does not say anything about the post forbearance options. It only provides for the forbearance right, for this temporary relief. Um, however, so what comes at the end, what a person might be eligible for on the back end will depend on the specific guidelines of the investor or insurer of the loan. And as I said, the federally backed loans all have guidelines that apply here. Um, we'll talk about what those rules are. For the privately held loans, loans that are either held in portfolio by a bank or held in a private label securitization, a mortgage-backed securities pool, those, it's unclear what the options are gonna be at the end of the forbearance. And, and for those of you that have been doing this work for some time, you may be familiar with those subprime mortgage-backed securities pools. A lot of those loans, either went through foreclosure or some type of modification or refinance, during the past 10 years, but there are still some of them out there. And so for those loans, it's gonna be tricky to find out what options the person will have at the end of the forbearance. As Andrea explained, most servicers are offering forbearance for the privately held loans, and they're usually doing 90 days, but it's not totally clear what they will offer for those private loans at the end of the forbearance. And as I said, this is about a third of the market, the private loans that are either held in portfolio or in securization. And remember, for the securization loans, there's something called the pooling and servicing agreement, the PSA. And some of those have restrictions on what it is possible to do to modify a loan. For example, some pooling and servicing agreements say you're not allowed to extend the term of the loan beyond the original amortization, or there's a limit on how many loans in the pool can be modified or modified in a given time period. So just be aware that if you're helping someone and they're trying to figure out what their options are, we still wanna encourage people to request a forbearance if they really need it, regardless of whether or not their loan is federally backed. But if someone has a loan that is not either government insured or owned by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, they need to know that their options at the end of the forbearance may be a lot more limited and they might want to prepare for that as much as possible. Um, and of course, keep in mind that if they can't get a loan modification and if they can't come up with a lump sum to get the loan caught up, there's always the possibility of a Chapter 13 bankruptcy plan at that point to take that arrearage and spread it over a three to five year chapter 13 plan. So that's really the ultimate backup plan for everybody, but especially for these private loans. And of course, you don't wanna be trying to put someone into a chapter 13 bankruptcy right now if they don't have regular income. So that's why the forbearance can help cover them until, they, until they, their income resumes and then the, the bankruptcy could be a backup option. So with these non-federally backed mortgages, it is a good idea to try to find out proactively what kinds of options are gonna be available or what types of restrictions might be there on possible loss mitigation at the back end. And Andrea has already mentioned this thing called a request for information or RFI. This is a kind of qualified written request under RESPA and the link here gives you a template that you can use if you want to, if you're talking with someone advising them to request a forbearance, right when they request that forbearance, if you know that it's not a federally backed mortgage, it would be a good idea to find out what pool owns this loan, who is the owner if it's in a pool, and then what restrictions, if any, do you wanna know about now for the loss mitigation that might be available at the end of the forbearance. All right, with the federally backed mortgages, there are some really good options. And the general rule of thumb is that most consumers, the vast majority, will not be required to pay the arrears in a lump sum at the end of the forbearance. This is really important. And this is a good policy decision, right? Because we do not want all of these mortgage holders, all these homeowners going into default and foreclosure. So to their credit, the federal agencies, which is of course the Federal Housing Administration, FHA, VA, USDA, and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they have all acted quickly to put out an array of options that are streamlined and that are designed to very easily get the arrearage moved to the back end of the loan and get that person started up and current on their mortgage once they recover 
permanent income. Um, and so the bottom line is, you know, and Calabria, Mark Calabria, who's the director of the Federal Housing Finance Agency, FHFA, which is over the conservator for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, put out a press release that basically said no lump sum payments for, for uh, FHFA, for Fannie and Freddie loans. Um, and that's the hyperlink here is that it would take you to that press release. It really is borne out in their, in their policies. So let's talk about what those policies are. For Fannie, for loans that are owned by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and I want to pause here briefly, I think Andrea alluded to this, but if you're helping someone and you're not sure if their mortgage is owned by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, these entities have a loan lookup tool. If you just Google Fannie Mae loan lookup or Freddie Mac loan lookup, you will find it very easily. And you put in the name address and the last four of the borrower's social, and it will say yes or no. Is this loan owned by Fannie or Freddie? For each of them, you have to check both separately. And that's absolutely important because most people do not know and have no reason to know if their mortgage is actually owned by Fannie or Freddie. All they know is I'm making my payments to Wells Fargo or I'm making my payments to Specialized Loan Servicing or whomever. There's no reason that they would know this. They're not told at any point. So they do have to check, but it's a huge chunk of the mortgage market, roughly half of mortgages in the US are owned by either Fannie or Freddie. So this applies to a lot of people, but you have to check and find out. If the loan is owned by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, the primary option for people at the end of the forbearance period is called the deferral. And really I wish they had chosen a different name for this option because, um, I'm sorry, I'm just realizing that my sound is a little unclear. Is it getting any better? I just wanna make sure, Christy, because I think I saw a text can you guys hear me okay? I can hear you, I can hear you fine. Okay, I'll make sure to stay close to the mic. I just wanted to make sure it was okay. So the deferral, is, the name could be confusing because it might sound like a forbearance. A forbearance is temporarily pausing payments or temporarily deferring payments. But this thing that's being called a COVID-19 payment deferral is a permanent deferral of those missed payments into a non-interest bearing balloon payment that will sit there at the end of the loan and it does not come due until the maturity date or if the mortgage is paid off early through a sale or refinance. Um, so what else do you need to know about the COVID-19 deferral, which is the primary option for Fannie and Freddie? In order to be eligible for this, the borrower has to have a delinquency that was caused by a COVID-related hardship and they must have been current or less than 31 days delinquent on March 1st of 2020. So what we're saying here is if they were already a few months behind or more than one month behind when COVID hit, that's gonna block them from this option. That's the biggest thing to remember. But for everybody who was current and then the, heart, the COVID related stuff started and then they fell behind, if they are up to 12 months delinquent, they should be eligible for this COVID-19 deferral of their payments. And what happens is the principal and interest portion of the payment will get put into that balloon at the end. And I, I should say, not the escrow portion of the payment, so not the tax and insurance portion, but if there were any escrow advances made by the servicer during the forbearance period, escrow advances, like if the escrow account had gone into the negative, that will get rolled in to the de deferral. But oftentimes they, they have not been paying the escrow portion. And so, you know, any of they, they basically will end up with an escrow shortage if they get this. And that's something we need to think about proactively. Um, but the deal with this deferral is it's meant to be very streamlined and automatic. The borrower does not have to submit an application. Um, and let me just say a little bit more about this. They do not have to submit any type of borrower response packet or proof of their income. All that has to happen is they have to indicate to the servicer that they can afford their regular contractual monthly payment. And the servicers are supposed to proactively reach out to the borrower when they're getting near the end of the forbearance. And Fannie and Freddie are requiring servicers to do that, to call them up and say, you're getting near the end of the forbearance, can you afford your regular payment? And if they say yes, and they meet those very basic eligibility rules, they should be given the deferral and it should be a very short, 
uh, you know, one or two page document that just says, this is an agreement that your payments are being deferred in this non interest bearing balloon and boom, you're done. You restart your regular monthly payments going forward. Uh, so it's a really logical and good option to get as many people as possible brought current on their mortgage without having to do the whole paperwork loan modification process. Remember, many of you have been doing this work long enough to know that during the HAMP period, we had enormous problems with the paper chase or whatever you want to call it, the seventh circle of hell that borrowers would go through to try to fax in documents over and over. And the servicers couldn't handle it then. And they definitely can't handle it with the percentage of mortgages that are in default now. So the goal here is to do this streamlined option that does not require proof of income or complicated uh, documentation. All right, if a borrower with a Fan or Freddie loan cannot afford their regular monthly payment, they need something more, and they could be eligible for a flex modification or the flex mod. Some of you may have heard of this. The flex mod has already been around for a while. It basically took the place of what used to be called a standard modification for Fannie and Freddie, and it's a lot like HAMP tier two, if you've been doing this work. Um, but the bottom line with the flex mod, so this is the same as the existing flex mod, and if borrowers can't afford their regular monthly payment, they, they maybe they've had, they got their job back, but their hours are less, they need a reduced payment, they can apply for the flex mod, or the servicer can offer it to them if they don't accept an offer of a deferral. And the basic rules are, there could be some principal forbearance, uh, where a chunk of the principal balance gets deferred into a balloon um, only if the borrower is is underwater on the home or possibly uh, close to being underwater. So the idea is to take principal forbearance to get them down to a 100% loan to value ratio or sometimes as low as 80% loan to value ratio. But for borrowers who have equity in their homes, they may not get any principal forbearance. They will, however, get a fixed interest rate that's set to basically the market rate and a new 40 year term. So this is a blunt instrument. A lot of people do not want a new 40 year term from today's date, but the goal of the flex modification is to reduce that payment significantly. And it does have that effect. I mean, this will drop somebody's payment pretty dramatically uh, if you stretch it up to a new 40 years at the current market rate. And the goal is to reduce the payment by at least 20%, reduce that principal and interest payment by at least 20%. All right, the other important thing to know about the flex modification is this is the option that is available if you were already in default before the COVID hardship period began. So remember what we said at the outset, the forbearance is available to everybody who has a COVID hardship, even if they were already behind on their mortgage because they had a prior hardship. But after the forbearance, that deferral, the streamlined deferral is only for people who were current until COVID hit. The flex modification is the backup option for those people who had some arrearage before March. That's what they're, they're going to have to look at the flex modification, basically, um, or a Chapter 13 bankruptcy if they really don't want this type of modification. Okay. Unless there's any questions about that, I'm going to keep going and talk about the corollary to this for FHA loans. Um, Andrea, is there anything I should no, clarify now? I'm not seeing any questions, Sarah. Okay, great. So I'll keep right on going and we'll have some time at the end to hit any other questions. Uh, so FHA insured mortgages have very similar options, but they have different names and a few little differences. So let's talk about what are the rules for FHA insured mortgages. There is a new kind of partial claim that's called the COVID-19 standalone partial claim. If you've ever dealt with FHA mortgages, you may have heard of what is a partial claim, but for folks who are newer to this area, I wanna explain what that is. FHA loans are insured by the federal government, meaning there is a lender and they may be in a pool, but the insurance is available in case later down the line there's a foreclosure, there's not enough money, and the lender has to make a claim on the insurance to cover a shortfall. So that's a normal paradigm. But there is something called a partial claim, 
where the lender can basically pull on that insurance and HUD will pay some amount of money, usually just enough to cover the arrearage that the borrower owes. And then the borrower will owe that money directly to HUD, which is basically the same as FHA. Keep in mind, FHA is under the umbrella of HUD. So whenever a borrower gets a partial claim, basically the lender is getting that money from HUD to bring the loan current. And now the borrower owes that money to HUD in a silent second mortgage that actually gets recorded in the real estate records. And at the end, it does, it's a lot like the deferral. It's that non-interest bearing balloon payment that will come due at the end of the loan or whenever it's the house is sold or refinanced. But the big difference with the FHA is because there's this insurance, FHA is the one that covers that money and technically it's now owed to FHA. So that's what a partial claim is. So HUD created this COVID-19 partial claim for, for most of the same people that were covered by the deferral for Fannie and Freddie. It's anybody who was less than 30 days behind as of March 1st, and they're able to afford their regular payments again. And they don't have to submit paperwork. All they have to do is indicate, tell the servicer on the phone, yes, I can afford my regular payment. And the servicer will send them this partial claim and that will stick the arrearage basically on the back end, as they say, and they'll pick right up with their regular monthly payments. One other thing about the partial claim, this is better than Fannie and Freddie. The partial claim will involve the full monthly payment, P-I-T-I. So even the escrow portion is gonna be brought current by this. So the people with FHA loans have a little better situation because they will not anticipate having an escrow shortage that will come up. Whereas with Fannie and Freddie, it's, it's done a little bit differently and at least we're bringing the loan current, but you are gonna have an escrow shortage with the Fannie and Freddie loans. Um, and we could talk about this more if people have questions at the end, but there are ways to deal with that escrow shortage um, on those Fannie and Freddie loans. But for FHA, you won't even have that problem because the partial claim is the full PITI payment for all the months that were missed and the cap, instead of being a 12-month cap, is the lifetime cap for partial claims, which is 30% of the principal balance. So 30% of the unpaid principal balance, the UPB, is the maximum partial claim. You do have to keep in mind that some FHA borrowers, keep in mind these are first-time homeowners, they're generally lower-income borrowers, some of them have had hardships in the past, and they might have had a prior partial claim. And the way to find that out, you can ask the borrower, they might remember, you can ask the servicer, they should know. The other way is to check the deed records because the partial claim gets recorded. Remember, it is a mortgage loan, it's a mortgage. So it'll be in the deed records, you can find any prior partial claims. And you need to make sure that when you account for that prior partial claim, is there still enough room left in the maximum lifetime partial claim to use it to bring the loan current. Um, and so keep in mind, the lifetime maximum for partial claims is 30% of the principal balance. And it's actually 30% as of the time of the first ever partial claim. So this can be a little hard to back into the math, but you can at least estimate it. If that partial claim, if there's not a partial claim available to, catch, to be used to catch up the arrearage, or if the borrower can't afford to resume their regular payments, FHA has an array of other options. And these were announced pretty recently. Um, there's a lot of detail here and I did not want to overwhelm people with detail. So we have listed them for you here. They're all covered in this mortgagee letter 2020-22. The mortgagee letters are these policy documents that HUD puts out periodically and you can find them by Googling mortgagee letter 2020-22. Um, but I will just tell you that basically what these options provide for is that if the standalone partial claim does not work because either the person has already maxed out their available lifetime partial claim or they need their payment reduced, they can't afford the monthly payment, they can flow into one of these other options. The first one, the owner occupant loan modification is mainly there to help people who have maxed out their partial claim. They've used up all the partial claim that there is. And so this is a loan modification where basically you just capitalize the arrearage. You take that arrearage and add it to the loan balance 
reduce the interest rate to the current market rate and stretch over a new 30 year term. That is how that one works. Um, so it's really gonna help people who don't have any more partial claim left, but they just need a way to get current. Um, the other two involve a combination of modifying the loan and also taking a partial claim. Um, and the, 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 the middle bullet point is one where the partial claim is used to cover only the arrearage. And the bottom one, which is the deepest cut in, in, in your monthly payment, is called FHA HAMP. And there's a special COVID-19 FHA HAMP that basically allows for reduced documentation. So many of you might already know about FHA HAMP and how those calculations work. It's different from private HAMP, the HAMP that we knew and loved from 2008 to 2016. But FHA HAMP, those rules have been in place for a long time now. It's really the primary FHA loan modification. Um, and so they just have created one that's called COVID-19 FHA HAMP and said, these folks don't have to submit a full packet. Um, they supply very reduced proof of their income. And so I'll just say a few words about how FHA HAMP works. This is the best case scenario for an FHA borrower who needs their payment to be reduced because they can't afford their regular monthly payment. And basically there's a target payment that's based on roughly 31% of their monthly income with some nuance. And essentially they can use that partial claim to chop off a chunk of the existing principal balance and put it into a balloon, into the partial claim. That will reduce the interest bearing principal balance and then reduce the interest rate to the market rate, which is this index, the primary mortgage market survey, PMMS, plus 0.25% and take it to a new 30 year term. So you can get a significant reduction in payment um, if the borrower needs it and they have an FHA loan. I wanted to mention the FHA National Servicing Center. This is the place to go if you have a borrower with an FHA insured loan and they're getting the runaround or they're getting having problems with the servicer. You can escalate that with the National Servicing Center by reaching out to them at this, at this contact info or feel free to reach out to us at NCLC. We can also help you with those situations sometimes. Um, I am not going to talk about USDA and VA loans. I apologize, but there are, you know, really FHA and Fannie Freddie is a much larger share of the market, but we included the information in the slides, which are going to be sent out to everyone. Uh, so you have that. And, and the bottom line is these are the same rules that have already been in place. Um, USDA and VA have not really created new COVID-19 options. It's basically the same array of loan modification, um, repayment plan, deed in lieu, all those typical options. Okay, I want to say just a few things about RESPA and credit reporting, and then we'll save some time in case there are more questions. And if there are not questions, we always can, can talk more. Andrea and I could go on for quite a while, I assure you. <laughs> but let's talk about RESPA. For those of you that are newer, RESPA stands for the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act. It's a federal law. Um, and it's uh, the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, issues regulations under RESPA. And anytime you're dealing with RESPA, if you want to find the regs, I would highly recommend the Bureau's website, consumerfinance.gov slash e-regulations. And then they have all of the statutes listed and you're gonna go to Regulation X, that is RESPA. Regulation Z is TILA, the Truth in Lending Act. But if you click on Regulation X down at the bottom, then you'll get all of these RESPA rules and the interpretations and different, different things. And it's just really easy to read, easier than Lexis or Westlaw. So RESPA has a number of mortgage servicing rules that apply. And one part of that is RFIs and NOEs, the request for information or notice of error that we've already alluded to, um, which are you know qualified written requests. All of that is under RESPA. The other things that are under RESPA are a set of loss mitigation rules, procedures that apply anytime a borrower on a residential mortgage asks for help. The servicer is required to comply with the RESPA rules and essentially follow these, this orderly process where you get a complete application, you review them for all available options, and there are certain dual tracking protections 
of course, to say that if someone is, is under review for loss mitigation, you shouldn't be foreclosing at the same time. So RESPA restricts the lender's ability to put people on a dual track and foreclose even though they're still under review for loss mitigation. So it's really important. And for folks who are newer to these issues, I highly recommend that you get to know RESPA if you're gonna handle mortgage cases. And, and just a pitch, we need as many people as possible to do this work. So if you haven't been doing mortgage tech cases, but you're interested, welcome on board. We would love to have you. Um, NCLC has a lot of resources. And of course, your colleagues throughout the state doing legal services work and pro bono work are here to help. Um, so just a quick word about the RESPA issues in the COVID-19 era. RESPA generally requires that anytime the borrower applies for help, the servicer has to do certain things by telling them how to complete that application. And when a borrower talks to their servicer and says, I need help and I lost my job due to COVID, that counts as an application. So normally the servicer would have to send them a letter within five business days telling them all the things they need to submit to make a complete application. And then they, they send those things in and then they get dual tracking protections and all of these other protections. However, servicers are not required to follow all those steps if they give the borrower a short term loss mitigation option, including a forbearance or a repayment plan. But what we're really focused on under COVID is the forbearance because that is the option that people need. So just be aware that if you know about the rest of the rules, if a servicer offers someone this short term forbearance, they're not going to be required to comply with all of the other aspects of RESPA, including sending that five day letter, so long as they, um, they give them another type of notice that says, we're giving you a short term option. Um, here's what it says, here's the duration and tells the borrower this was based on an incomplete application. We did not get you to complete. We, we gave you this based on an incomplete application. However, we are informing you that there are other options available. And if you want to be reviewed for all available options, you've got to submit a complete application. And so long as the borrower is performing under this short term forbearance, the servicer is not allowed to foreclose. And if they violate RESPA, that's a private right of action for actual damages, statutory damages, and attorney's fees. So it's very powerful law. So keep in mind, and there's, there's also another thing you need to know, which is the exceptions to RESPA allow the servicer to avoid having to do all of the usual things, including considering people for all options. Um, and there's an anti-evasion rule that says you can't try to evade those rules by giving people something that's not as good. You have to consider them for all options. So the question comes up with these deferral. The deferral that happens at the end of the forbearance is not a short-term loss mitigation option. There's another rule called the blind offer rule, where if a servicer gives you an offer that's based on nothing that you have told them, that is also okay. But with the deferral, technically they had to ask, can you afford your regular payments? So it did not strictly fit under any of these exceptions to RESPA. So the CFPB has issued an interim final rule. And I think that's my, uh, my let's see. Well, no, I don't have a slide on that, sorry. Uh, well, I guess like, it's just the heading here. The interim final rule says that servicers can offer those COVID-19 permanent deferrals and permanent partial claims um, and they will not be violating RESPA. So basically the CFPB just announced this. It took effect July 1st, but there is still a comment window that's open until August 14th. So I would encourage you, if you're doing this work, um, be aware that there is a comment window. NCLC is going to file comments by, uh, by next Friday. And um, if you want more information or it's a sample comment, we can provide you that. But basically, our, we, we think that this is a logical fix that the CFPB made, but we would like them to go further by also protecting the people who can't go into that bucket of the deferral or the partial claim because they need a modification. Those people are now gonna be at risk of foreclosure unless they submit a complete application before the end of their forbearance. So we're trying to get the CFPB to go a little bit further under RESPA and actually say that the 120 day protected pre-foreclosure period will not start to run 
until after the forbearance and until someone has been reviewed for all options uh, that are available. So just be aware of this interim rule, interim final rule that basically solves the rest of problems, but we're asking the Bureau to do a little bit more to help people. All right, there's also this question of when the borrower should submit a complete application. They've got a forbearance, they're struggling, and you're thinking to yourself, okay, I want them to get that complete application in before the forbearance ends, but I don't wanna submit it too early, because remember, there is this one bite at the apple rule that servicers only have to comply with the rest of the rules one time for one complete application, um, and unless the loan becomes current again and then falls behind again. So in general, you wanna wait until they have gotten to the end of their available forbearance, that maximum one year of forbearance, um, and then they are, are, that's the best time, but still to get that application submitted at least about 30 days before the end so they can make it complete. Um, and the very brief thing I'll say about credit reporting before we see if we have any other questions is to be aware that the CARES Act does have some credit reporting provisions. The general rule is that if you were current at the time you go into a forbearance, the lender has to continue reporting you as current. So they're not allowed to report you as delinquent or in a special option. They have to continue the same reporting that they were doing at the time you entered the agreed upon forbearance. Um, and so if you were delinquent before you got the forbearance, they're allowed to keep on reporting delinquency. But if you were current and then you got into that formal forbearance, it protects you from that negative reporting. Um, and then I will stop and see Andrea or Christy, are there any questions we should take? The rest of these are just some resources um, and reminders for people. I'm not seeing any questions. I, I did see a hand raised, um, but if people do have questions, please put them either in the chat or the, the Q&A box. Yep. And uh, while we're waiting one more minute, I'll just mention CFPB complaints. If anyone doesn't know, the, the, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau collects consumer complaints. Um, they use that to determine if servicers are, are doing things that are a problem and they can bring enforcement actions. And it's also a source of information for people around the country about pattern and practice of servicers doing bad things. So please, if you're seeing problems with any of this, file a CFPB complaint or encourage your client to file one. So I, there are, I don't see any questions, but I did just want to follow up a little bit um, on some practice tips because we do have a couple more minutes. So, you know, the CARES, the CARES Act uh, does not have a private right of action. So, you know, you can't sue under the CARES Act per se um, for violation of the CARES Act, but you can use the request for information or a notice of error to maybe hold the servicer's feet to the fire, so to speak. So if you request information, who's the owner of my loan, what's the contact information, what are the loss mid options, and they don't respond, and you send another RFI and they don't respond, and you send another one and they don't respond, then you may have a pattern in practice of non-compliance with RESPA. And so you can use RESPA to kind of hold servicers to their obligation under the CARES Act. And the same thing with the notice of error, if your client is entitled to a forbearance agreement and the servicer is saying, no, you're not entitled, but you know they have a federally backed mortgage loan, you know they have a COVID related financial hardship, and the servicer is saying, no, you're not entitled to a forbearance or you're only entitled to a three month forbearance, then you know that, that that's an error and you can send a notice of error, which is like a request for information, again, to the correct um, address. And the servicer will have 30 days, 30 business days to investigate and reply. And if they say, nope, you're still only entitled to that three months or six months total, sorry. And you know that's wrong because the CARES Act says up to a year then you can send another notice of error. And so they're not <laughs> complying with RESPA. They're not doing a reasonable investigation and correcting that error. So you may have a cause of action under RESPA for violation of the CARES Act. Um, and you may have a violation under your state, under Florida's UDAP, the Unfair and Deceptive Act and Practices Statute, 
uh, as well, saying that, that my client was entitled to this and they kept saying no, 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 that may be an unfair and deceptive act in practice towards your client. So I did want to mention that, that if servicers are not complying with this, there may be options available to uh, hold them to their obligations. That's a really good point, Andrea. And we do have one question that came in. So maybe we can take this quickly. I think you can address it. I'll, I'll read it to you. It says, I have a client who recently submitted a loan mod packet, even though their income was reduced as a result of COVID. Do you suggest that they request forbearance instead and then reapply for a loan mod once their income is back to what it used to be? So, so I would say that's you do have to do a careful analysis around that because they may get a loan mod now based on their reduced income and that mod may be a very sustainable payment for them um, because it's based on a lower income amount. Mm -hmm. So it may be a decent time to ask for a modification if they're eligible and can get one and can sustain it. So if they don't think their income is going to drop anymore or they're going to be out of work soon, then it may be an okay time to ask for a mod. If they think their income is going to drop some more, there's a chance they may be out of work or they're given a mod that is not sustainable, then they can look at the forbearance to get back on their feet and back on track. Did you have more to that, Sarah? I totally agree with that. And I think that um, it'd be good to check and see if it's FHA, Fannie or Freddie or none of the above. Um, but with, with that said, I think you're absolutely right that if they can afford a modified payment, then that would be a good option. But if it's going to be hard for them to afford any payment, then they should definitely consider the forbearance. So it depends how big the reduction is. Yeah. Yes. I don't see any more any more questions. Do you guys? I no, think thank you so much for all that great information. Uh, and thank you to everyone for attending. I really appreciate Sarah and Andrea taking time out of your busy schedules. I know it must be crazy trying to keep track of all the changes on a national level. <laughs> it's hard enough for us to keep up in Florida. So I really appreciate you presenting this information to us. And I just want to remind everyone that there will be a link sent out tomorrow by Zoom with a link to the PowerPoint materials and the recording of this webinar. And then I'll send the CLE credit information as soon as I get it. I hope everyone has a great weekend and thank you again to Sarah, Andrea, and NCLC. Take care. Thank everyone. you. Take care.